As you spend more time in the lab, you will start to notice that lab work generates a lot of waste. Unlike the garbage we produce during our day-to-day -day lives, lab waste is usually contaminated with hazardous chemicals and can harm the environment if not handled properly. As a result, federal and state regulations have very strict rules regarding how chemical wastes must be classified, collected, and disposed of. In this video, we will talk about some general rules on how to dispose of lab waste properly. There are three types of waste containers in our teaching labs. Solid waste bins, broken glass disposal boxes, and liquid waste bins. Solid waste such as used gloves and plastic by pets must be disposed of in the solid waste bin. The broken glass disposal box is where we put broken glassware. It is important to separate the sharp pieces of glass from other trash, so we do not hurt those who handle the waste for us. Two notes about handling broken glass. One, we should never pick up broken glass by hand. Use a broom and dustpan to clean it up. Two, the glass that goes into the glass disposal box must be clean. Liquid waste bins host all the solution waste we produce during lab work and these bins are typically kept in a designated waste satellite accumulation area in the lab. Oh no! During the experiment, our beaker fell off the bench. How should we handle this waste? Please never try to clean the contaminated broken glassware. You do not want to be scratched by glass that contains potentially hazardous chemicals. Most of the waste we generate in the lab is liquid waste. Therefore, we will highlight a few rules on how to handle liquid waste properly. Rule number one, always know the number of liquid waste streams we will generate. In other words, the number of different types of liquids that will need to be collected. While some liquids can be disposed of together, there are some types of liquid waste that are incompatible and should never be mixed. Mixing inappropriate liquid waste together can cause unwanted and potentially dangerous chemical reactions. If you're not careful, a waste jar can easily turn into a bomb. That must never happen. Two of the most common waste streams in our teaching labs are the aqueous waste and the organic waste. In a teaching lab, the instructor usually informs us of the types of waste streams that should be kept separately. When working independently as researchers, we can get the waste disposal information from the safety data sheet for the chemical. The rule of thumb is to always know the right way to dispose of something before you start to use it. If an experiment involves the use of the following liquids, aqueous copper two sulfate solution, aqueous sodium chloride solution, and hexane, how many waste streams must you keep? The answer is two waste streams. Aqueous copper two sulfate and sodium chloride solution can be disposed of together in the aqueous waste. However, hexane, an organic solvent, should be disposed of separately in the organic waste. Rule number two, always label the waste container. During the experiment, it may be more convenient to use a beaker as a temporary waste container instead of making frequent trips to the waste bin every time a small amount of waste is generated. To do so, we can choose a large glass beaker and label it as the waste beaker. If it is used for general aqueous waste, a waste label is sufficient. However, if it is used for other types of waste, such as organic waste, we should mark it clearly as organic waste. In general, it is a good idea to label any container in the lab so we know exactly what it contains and can handle it properly. One note, we should always keep the waste beaker in the fume hood, especially when it contains organic solvents which can be volatile. If an experiment involves the use of aqueous copper two sulfate solution, what is the best practice to handle this waste during the experiment? That's right, you'll likely find it most expedient to use a local waste beaker, properly labeled as waste, that you keep in a nearby fume hood. 
when the waste beaker gets about 75% full. Dispose of it in the larger satellite waste bins. In addition to the waste beaker, the large waste container must also be labeled. This label is usually prepared by the lab manager, with the chemical formula of each compound in the waste clearly listed. When emptying your own waste beaker into the large waste bin, you must always read the label first. You do not want to mix incompatible wastes and cause a bad reaction. This is especially important when an experiment involves multiple waste streams. Where should we dispose of our waste that contains aqueous copper 2 sulfate solution? The label on bin 1 suggests it's for organic wastes, including acetone and hexane, so we definitely should not put our aqueous copper 2 sulfate waste in bin 1. The label on bin 2 says that it is for aqueous waste that contains sodium carbonate and sodium sulfate. If you are new to the field of chemistry and are not sure whether copper 2 sulfate is compatible with sodium carbonate and sodium sulfate, you should ask your instructor for clarification. If you decide that copper 2 sulfate is compatible with the other chemicals, you should write the chemical formula and the name of copper 2 sulfate on the waste label after you add it. Rule number three, always monitor the amount of waste. During the experiment, we will gradually accumulate waste in the waste beaker. It is important to monitor the amount of waste. You don't want it to fill completely, as it will make transporting the waste beaker difficult and increase the chance of a chemical spill in the lab. When the waste beaker is about three quarters or 75% full, it is time for you to make the trip to the larger waste container. At the end of the experiment, you should always remember that temporary waste beaker needs to be cleaned. Make sure to empty the waste beaker completely and rinse it with small amounts of DI water two to three times. The first rinse is also waste and must be disposed of in the waste bin, while the others can go down the sink. In addition to monitoring the amount of waste you collect in a beaker, you should also pay attention to the level of waste in the large waste bin. Think about the chemical hygiene officers that will remove the waste for us after we are done with the experiment. If you overfill this large waste bin, it will make their job challenging and pose threats to their safety. Therefore, you should never add more to the waste bin if it is about three quarters full. At the end of an experiment, you are tired and want to quickly clean up and go home. As you're trying to empty out the waste beaker, you notice that the waste bin in your lab is almost full. What should you do now? We know that sometimes working in a lab can be tiring, but you must always be kind to the environment and be thoughtful of those who process the waste for us. Your lab instructor will be so grateful if you could let them know that the waste is almost full. One final note. Although we have spent most of this video discussing good chemical hygiene and waste handling practices, we must also be conscious about the amount of waste we produce, as the treatment of contaminated waste usually involves energy-intensive processes. We should also try to minimize the amount of waste we produce to make the lab greener and reduce our carbon footprint. Which of the following are good lab practices in reducing the amount of chemical waste we produce? Never take more reagents than what you think you'll need, and always rinse with limited amount of chemicals. These two practices are essential for minimizing the amount of waste you generate. And of course, being prepared for the lab substantially reduces the chances that you will need to start over. If you do need to repeat an experiment, then you would be making much more waste than that is necessary. Always remember, being prepared, working safely, and showing concern for the safety of others and the planet are key attributes of successful scientists. Mm -hmm.